This little tiny country is not going to leave the center of our headlines until the Lord comes. It is not going away. This will be the central issue in world politics until Jesus comes. He's coming back to a Jewish Jerusalem to set up a millennial reign for a thousand years. And we need to look at the Jewish side of things as well as the Christian side of things in order to be well balanced. The following is a paid program by Zola Levitt Ministries. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Zola Levin presents. Shalom and welcome to our program. I'm Miles Weiss. And I'm Catherine Weiss. And we want to welcome you to our program today. Again, we have some exciting programs to bring our viewers, yes. Miles. Yeah, we do. We were able to be at the Future Congress too. We were there with speakers, Hal Lindsey, Bill Koenig and others. And I was able to bring a message on Israel and world revival. You know. Jesus left two commandments when he, when he left this yeah. earth. He told the disciples that they would not see him again until they said, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed are those who come in the name of the Lord. He gave us that command to be looking for him in Matthew 23, 39. He also said in Matthew 24, 14, that this gospel, this good news, this message would be preached to all the world and then the end would come. Mm. And so we know that there's a message in there for Israel and also for the nations. And in the day in which we're living, it's incredible to see that Israel herself is beginning to send the good news out again, just as she did 2,000 years ago. So let's go now and hear Miles speak about Israel and world revival. So Israel and world revival, the place of Israel in our lives, we really have to go back 4,000 years to understand this calling. You know, we think of life in the Christian church, we think of life beginning at the cross. And so many churches, they speak about life beginning at the cross. And we know that spiritual life does begin there for us when we're born again. But your story begins 4,000 years ago with the call of Abraham, which is interesting. Instead of the 2,000 year portion, you have the 4,000 year portion. If you would like, you can have the double portion. And the double portion is the entrance of your life into the life of Israel because you're grafted in to the commonwealth of Israel. And it's a 4,000 year old story. So the double portion is available to you today and to me as well. And we need to strive for it. We need to reach for that. We need to not give up even though we see churches languishing in their uh, reach for this. Now I have some good news. Uh, we just recently become connected with a church that is about 5,000 members, which in Northern California is a mega church. It may be anywhere a mega church, but in Northern California it is stupendous that there are 5,000 people gathering in one place, two campuses actually. This church has gotten the download from heaven that they need to have at the center of their life Jewish ministry. And not only so, calling Catherine and myself to be the pastors of their Jewish ministry, but they have determined to send the first tenth of a tenth, it's the beginning, of all their finances to ministries in Israel. Now, they are putting their money where their mouth is. They're putting their money where their heart is. And I thought, as this church has come into this calling and begin to understand that this is not a side stream, this is a mainstream to God, that as they're doing that, we're praying that it's going to be a template for other churches to realize that in the day in which we're living, we cannot move forward in our personal walk, we cannot move forward in our corporate walk without getting this understanding in the center of our lives. As again, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but we need to recognize that not to give up on our pastors and friends and those we know in spiritual leadership who you've prayed for. And the idea that I want to get across to you today, one of the ideas is to come humbly to them Come in low and find the place of service, a place of connecting with them and serving their purposes so that you can have a voice to them to say, have you considered my servant Israel? Have you consider considered the reality that, in fact, the uh, random Jewish people are not getting saved, so-called, 
but in fact, we, the Gentile church, are grafted in, the international church is grafted in to the commonwealth of Israel, according to Ephesians chapter 2. And so, don't give up. I want to say that there's hope. As long as we're breathing, and as long as there are people that are recognizing that this little place, as we heard last night, this little tiny country is not going to leave the center of our headlines until the Lord comes. It is not going away. This will be the central issue in world politics until Jesus comes. He's coming back to a Jewish Jerusalem to set up a millennial reign for a thousand years. And we need to look at the Jewish side of things as well as the Christian side of things in order to be well balanced. I remember when I first came into Jewish ministry and uh, one world leader actually insisted on calling me rabbi and I was thinking back to Moish Rosen of Jews for Jesus warning me in my early days saying, Miles, don't let them call you rabbi because it's offensive to the mainstream Jews. It's offensive to Jews for Moses, not Jews for Jesus. And so be careful with that and be careful of those labels. And no matter what I said to this man, he insisted on calling me his rabbi. You're my rabbi, Miles. And I finally gave up and let him do it. But he said to me, I, I need your help because you're so balanced in the way you understand the relationship between the church and the Jewish people. And I said, you know, Ed, I'm very balanced. I have chips on both shoulders. <laughs> and that is, in fact, what keeps me going, keeps me steady. The reality is that so many pastors have been hurt by the Messianic movement and what we Jewish folks call Messiantics, that they need to be healed up, they need to be instructed, they need to be helped to come into this understanding in a way that may require some gentleness, some care, some pastoral care of the pastors along the way in order for them to lead their people into what you already know to be true. That said, one of the best ways you can do that is to bring them to Israel. Have your pastor come to Israel and bring his people to Israel. That is life-changing. Uh, we've brought so many pastors to Israel, and they, they come away with the same testimony, which you've heard, which is, why wasn't this 35 years ago in seminary? Why did I wait my whole life to hear this message? This is what I've needed. Of course, now when they come home, and they're facing the mortgage on the church, it becomes much more difficult to remember those revelatory moments in Israel, and you have to stay with them and help them to stay in the revelation of this, these truths. But the reality is that because of the psychologizing of the church and the lukewarming of the church and the falling away of season that we're in, it's very hard for the church at large to keep this issue at the center of its heart. Why? Because it's costly. There's nothing in it for me. It's for someone else. It's for the sake of the kingdom. It's for the sake of Yeshua. It's for the sake of the Jewish people, who uh, I know as a Jew are not always such a lovely group of people. Now, I can say that. Please, you can't say that. Uh, the J word, you know, you have to be careful. But I can say it. And the fact is that we're not always the loveliest group around. We know that about ourselves. But the, one of the most precious scriptures about the way the nations and Israel work together or don't work together is in Zechariah chapter 1 verses 14 and 15 where God says about Israel emphasizing my redemption is what I'm calling them to. I've, yes, I've been angry with them for a little while, but I'm calling them to redemption and restoration. His heart is always about restoration, whether it's personally, that's why Catherine and I work with marriages, or whether it's uh, corporately as a nation. There's always the redemption that's in his heart first, and then he will correct along the way. The problem is that the nations, and he says this in that passage in Zechariah, he says, you went too far. You meant it for evil. In other words, the nations, in helping God to correct Israel, went a little too far over the course of the centuries, which answers one of the next questions is, why don't Jewish people get that Jesus is our Messiah? Why is it so hard? And I can answer that in three or four words. The Inquisition, the Crusades, the pogroms, and the Holocaust. Those are good reasons for Jewish people not to get that there's a relationship between our Messiah and ourselves. We have a, a spotted history with the church. And so it's, uh, there's a lot of gap to overcome when you're helping Jewish people come to understand that the most Hebrew thing we can do is follow the Jewish Messiah. That is the most Jewish thing I can do. 
you know, my, my family, I, I joke about that, that uh, the rabbis call me pastor, the pastors call me rabbi, my patients call me doc, my family calls me Meshuggah. Because, <laughs> because what is this thing you're doing, Miles, that since 1984 you've been on this, are you going to get over this? Is this a passing phase? You married a Gentile, now you're following, going around the world with the gospel of Jesus. Are you going to get over this? Is this a passing phase? Is this like the other things you did as a teenager? I'm 61 years old. I think they figured out that by now this is going to stick. You know, this is not going away. And the reality is that that's what's happening for you as well, this burning passion to understand the one new man and to help others understand it. It's not going to go away. So. Israel and church re revival. This goes back for you 4,000 years to the call of Abraham. When Abraham was called out, your life began. The t clock started ticking, and God started helping us to understand where we've come from and where we're going. <clears throat> we are hewn from the rock that Abraham is. He was cut out and set aside and called out. So what does it mean about the identity of a Jew? Really, a Jewish person, the original Jewish person, is a Gentile who is called out sovereignly by God. He did this without the benefit of a sermon, without a pastor, without a small group, without any of the, uh, the commensurate little things that we do in the churches that we have to help one another grow, to disciple one another. It was a sovereign call of God that called him out. Now, historians tell us that Abraham was probably uh, from an idol-making family, very wealthy to begin with, and then going to becoming wealthier when he was walking with God. But he was from an idol-making family, and they probably were doing very well in Ur of the Chaldees. And the call on them to come out of this cosmopolitan place into this life of wandering is very challenging. You may have felt like that sometimes along the way yourselves, where, God, is there a resting place for me? You know, sometimes for some of us, we feel like we're just kind of on the move, and there's really never a place where we feel exactly at home. Because our home is not here. Our home is in a city whose maker and builder is God. And so there's going to be a sense for some of us that there's no place on earth that really feels home-like, except maybe when you land in Israel. And how many times have I heard that? And you've probably said it yourself. When I landed here, I felt like I came home, finally. And I hear that all the time from people. Show your support for Israel with the Pro-Israel Package. For your gift of $48 or more, you'll receive a 3 foot by 5 foot flag of Israel, four Pro-Israel buttons, a Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem bumper sticker, Israel's Right to the Land booklet, a Jerusalem Journey Stone, Broken Branches by Zola Levin, and a two-flag lapel pin. Call and ask for the Pro-Israel Package or visit us at levitt.com. For insightful perspectives on Israel and Bible prophecy, ask for our free monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. At levitt.com you can read the newsletter, watch the TV program, or visit our online store. Stay current with us on social media via Facebook and Twitter. Come with us on a tour of Israel or Petra, or a cruise to Greece and Ephesus. Please contact us for more information. Israel is the most exciting place in the world. Not only is it on your headlines every day, but when you walk the land, you realize that you're not getting the whole story. Mm. You really need to come there and walk where Jesus walked, be where the disciples were, and really learn what the prophets were speaking of. It's so wonderful to be there. You can learn more about the Word. It comes alive there. We would love to host you. So join us for an Israel tour uh, called 1-800-WONDERS or go and see us at levitt.com. And while you're there, you can get our newsletter. Sign up for it. It's free to you. And it is full of information about Israel, about the, where we are prophetically in time. It's got Hebrew lessons, financial lessons. It's a really great resource. And our resource this week 
is the pro-Israel package. It's a collection of items that will help you remember to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and also give you some information about why we believe in the centrality of Israel regarding the Messiah. It's because of your gifts of funds that we're able to give you this newsletter for free. So we thank you for supporting our ministry and what God is doing in these last days with the Jewish people and bringing that one new man perspective. So we're gonna go back now and hear more from Miles about the Messianic perspective of world revival. So let's go back be before Abraham to Genesis in chapters 1, 2, and 3 in the fall of man, this downward spiral began, this fall of man away from God that needed to be redeemed, this need for redemption. So God encounters this man who was of the line of Shem, was of the line of Eber, the Hebrew, and he, he, he brings this, this man out of the line of Shem, and, and by, by the call on Abraham, he sets up an encounter that affects the destiny of every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth throughout history. We can say no, there's always that option, and we, we grieve over friends and loved ones who say no to Yeshua, who is the ultimate goal of Abram's call. But if we don't say no, if we do say yes, we begin this other process of the restoration unto life that began with Abram. So Abram, according to Romans chapter 4, was a Gentile called out and brought unto God and sets up a pattern for you and for me. He was looking for a city. Now there's a threefold call on Israel that affects the nature of the church. It affects the call that's on you personally as well. There's a birthing call on Israel to birth the things of God, to birth the patterns of God, to birth the story, the history. I joke with, uh, with my, my friends and, and Co colleagues in ministry that if you want to know the dirt in my family history, just pick up your Bible and open to any page. And, you know, the la dirty laundry is there for you to see at any time. No other family on earth has so much dirty laundry aired before the world other than the Jewish people. And that's because God is redemptive. And so he's saying, look, here's the laundry list. But guess what? I've got an expected end for you. I'm taking you somewhere. I'm bringing you into a restoration that is so far beyond what we could ask or think. It's exceeding abundantly above what we could ask or think. It's way beyond the personal breakthroughs, the personal victories. It's a national, international, a global redemption that God is offering to us through the finished work of Yeshua. So there's a birthing call on Israel. He births the things that will pertain to life and godliness, the things that will pertain to everyone who calls himself a believer. There's a salvation call. John 4, John 4, 22, Yeshua says to the Samaritan woman, salvation is of the Jews. You worship on this mountain. The Jews worship in Jerusalem. But the reality is that I'm calling those who will worship me in spirit and in truth. And the reality is that salvation is of the Jews. The entire salvation story comes through the Jewish people. And that's one of the heartaches for us as, as Jewish believers and those of you, the, the Gentile messianics, the ones that are knit, have knit themselves consciously, purposefully to the heart of Israel and the heart of God, is the, one of the painful aspects is that the church at large does not see that. They believe that it's somehow God has, it's really a Marcionite heresy. It's a first century heresy. Marcion said that he divided the word into uh, two groups, you know, the, the bad Old Testament and the good New Testament, the bad Jews and the good Christians, the bad angry Jehovah and the good happy gentle shepherd Jesus. And so forever put replacement theology in place. Now, let me take that back. And so he put replacement theology into movement, but it will be recovered because it's being recovered in our day. The reality is that this Marcionite heresy is everywhere in the church. They believe the, the Bible begins with the New Testament, the Brit Chadashah. And I love hearing about the, the brothers around the world that are taking that middle page, that white page between Malachi and Matthew. They take it and they, with a razor blade and they circumcise their Bibles. They take out that blank page because there's a seamless connection between Malachi, and actually in our Bible it's Second Chronicles, but between Malachi and Matthew 
there is a seamless connection. It's one whole story, as someone has said, from Genesis to maps, right? Mm -hmm. It's one whole story. And so we need to recognize that we're, we're carrying this understanding, we're carrying this revelation that this is a bigger story than just a New Testament church. And, and we need both sides. The third aspect of the call upon Israel is this, this Romans 3 advantage of the Jew. What advantage has the Jews? And Paul says, much in every way. Because unto the Jews was committed the oracles of God, the temple service, the word of God. Everything that has to do with life and godliness was committed to the Jewish people so that the world could know it. That's why Jesus in John 17 is so strong about saying that they, meaning those out there, he's speaking to his Jewish disciples when he says that they may come to know the oneness that I have with you through the word that you, Jewish disciples, speak to them. Looking forward to Paul's life and the life of the apostles, recognizing that these Jewish disciples would bring the word to the Gentile world. And whosoever will would have the opportunity to come into salvation through the Jewish people. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was in um, Arizona. Jonathan Burns held the Messianic Leaders Roundtable. It was this precious group. I was so thrilled. You may have read about this in the, in the Levitt letter, but I was so blessed by the maturity that I saw in the Messianic movement. Not only are we older, fatter, and balder, <laughs> so we've seen that kind of growth, but I saw a heart to serve one another that I had never seen before. A heart to include the Gentiles and the Jews together. A heart to overcome any exclusivity on the part of the Jewish ministries or any exclusivity on the part of Gentile ministries and to work together as the one new man. And it was so powerful, it was so precious. There was a special moment for me. Jonathan Kahn came with a, with a torch that he had been given a, a week before in, um, in uh, Madras, India, where Thomas, the disciple, brought the gospel to southern India. The gospel has gone up through the north. If you've been to India, you know that there's been a strong gospel movement in India through the centuries, <clears throat> starting in the south. The north has been much more difficult. Well, Catherine and I and the ministry we were involved in years ago labored for years going in and out of India and seeing amazing things happen there. And it always was amazing to me that, that they knew the history of their connection with Jerusalem because they recognized the Martoma church, the Thomas-based church, recognized that they had come from the gospel going out of Jerusalem. Well, here's a replacement theology note for you. I'm about three years old in the Lord. I come back from India, four years maybe, come back from India, and I'm giving a testimony about how it was so exciting to be on St. Thomas Hill outside Madras and to see how this movement began when this nice Jewish boy brought the gospel from Jerusalem to India. And through miracle signs and wonders, the, the church was birthed in India and how precious that was to me as a new Jewish believer. And after I gave that testimony to a church of about five, 600 people, one of the elders came to me, elder's wife, came to me and said, you know, you really made a mistake in the pulpit. Well, I did. I'm sorry. What did I do? Well, you said that Thomas was a Jew, but Thomas was a Christian. <laughs> he had been a Jew, and he was now a Christian. And I thought, something's wrong here, but I'm too young to know what it is. I just know there's something not right here. But you know, when you encounter that, and when it really runs deep, it's like a gut punch, you know? You can't put your finger on it, but there's this gut punch of uh, anti-Semitism, of replacement theology, of the failures in the history of the church. It all goes at one, like, one good shot in your gut, and you know something's wrong, but you're not sure what it is, do you, Mr. Jones, Mr. Cohen? And so <clears throat> I, I tried to correct it, but I couldn't in my spirit correct it, you know? The reality is that that's what happened. Thomas was a born-again believer in Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, Call him a Christian. I love the way Zola said, call me whatever you want. Call me a Christian. That's what they first called us in, in Antioch. That's fine with me. You know, he wasn't putting an emphasis on those words. Today, we have, we have to, in a sense, recover the language. I think of the Messianic movement as a, a movement in search of a label. You know, we really need some new labels because uh, 
everything's been compromised a little bit in terms of the way people have wrote reactions to these, these words, messianic or Christian even per se. So there's a way that we need to find this language to help people to open their spirits. But that was a seminal moment for me as a, early, as a young believer to realize that there was this split between my experience, which was somewhat seamless regarding this new thing that was happening to me that my family was shocked by, but they were, they were blessing. They were glad to see me not be as crazy as I had been previously. So as far as they were concerned, you know, this looked like an okay thing, even though it was odd. And unlike many Jewish believers who come into persecution by their families, I did not have that testimony. In fact, my mom and my sister both became believers before they left the planet. And that's the economy of God, you know, that you follow Him and you listen for Him and He'll take care of your family. I think that's a word for some of you here today. You're praying for family, for loved ones. Do not give up. Do not give up. As a mother, I know that God is faithful as we continue to pray and stand for our whole household to yes, be saved. Yes, that's right. The Philippian jailer, you shall be right. saved and your house. Yeah. And it's really a very personal thing. It's really one by one. I mean, God is reaching into the nations. He's reaching into Israel. But we have to believe for that personal transformation that comes as we say yes to Yeshua. We're working with a church in Northern California where they they say that when we began to pay attention to Jewish ministry right. and to giving to Israel, we've seen increase in salvation, increase in the growth in numbers in the church. It's been a phenomenal change that they're experiencing just by making the connection between Israel and world revival. We need to do both. And that's the kind of time that we're in these days, is we need to pay attention to Jerusalem where the Lord is returning. Amen. And we need to pay attention to the nations so that the gospel can go out as Yeshua said it would before he returns. Yeah. There's a blessing in that for us all. And so as we leave you today, we want to remind you as we always do, Shalu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Show your support for Israel with the Pro-Israel Package. For your gift of $48 or more, you'll receive a three foot by five foot flag of Israel, four Pro-Israel buttons, a Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem bumper sticker, Israel's Right to the Land booklet, a Jerusalem Journey Stone, Broken Branches by Zola Levitt, and a two-flag lapel pin. Call and ask for the Pro-Israel Package or visit us at levitt.com. Our monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter, is free and full of insightful articles and news commentary from a messianic perspective. Visit levitt.com to find our newsletter along with current and past programs, our television schedule, and much more. Your donations to Zola Levitt Ministries help these organizations bless Israel. Please remember, Zola Levitt Ministries depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.